Let us pray. Father, we thank you for what you are teaching us. We pray that we will not just hear and forget, but as we learn, we'll make use of these things in a practical way in every one of our lives. And as we teach, our lives will back up our messages. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tonight again I want to talk to you on consecrating the little things. That means of course consecrating the little things unto God. For God to use. Luke chapter 21. I'm reading there from verse 1. And he looked up and saw the rich men casting in their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, Of a truth, I say unto you, that this poor widow has cast in more than they all. For all these have of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God, but she of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. Consecrating the little things unto God. Many times we are eager to use great talents, contribute great things, that we forget that life is made up of little, little things. A little passing attitude of love, little word of kindness, a little deed that is done for just about ten minutes or just about one hour, a little helping hand that is given many times will go a longer way than the big things that some people try to do. Now here it was offering to the Lord in the place of worship. And Jesus watched all the people as they were casting in their gifts. He watched the rich men as they were casting in much into the treasury. Then he observed the poor widow casting in only two mites. Alone, the two mites perhaps will do nothing. Perhaps that church could do without the two mites. You won't be able to buy too much of the two mites. If she didn't give it in, it will not affect the offering too much, at least in her mind. And the pastors and the preachers will not pester her life if they knew that that is all that she needed. They might even excuse her. Do not worry yourself. But God takes notice of such little things. She cast in just the two mites. And Jesus called attention to her. And said, Of a truth, I say unto you, this poor widow has cast in more. It meant more to God. It was great in the sight of God. Maybe she didn't think too much of what she cast in. But to Christ and to God and to the disciples, after Jesus had told them it meant so much, she had been faithful. No doubt, the Holy Ghost had been speaking to her. You go forward and put in your bait as well. She could have resisted. She could have grumbled. She could have grudged God for not making her rich. She could have grudged God for taking away her husband. Or she could have said, there is no accommodation, there is no husband. And the, the two mites I have is useless to me and useless to God. She might not even have come to church at all. That's a possibility. So poor that 
she would have said, well, if God is not thinking about me and this is all I have, what am I going to do in the house of God? God doesn't need me anyhow. How do you feel? That here we are. Now we have a large ministry. I'm sure you know that we have people uh, who are graduates in our midst and, um, you know, they can do a lot. You have much knowledge. All the knowledge you have can be written on a single sheet of paper and it will not fill the whole paper. That's what I mean by two mites. I mean all the wisdom you have. When we call people for counseling, you can uh, teach all you have to a five-year-old child and your wisdom is exhausted. That's what we mean by the two mites. You don't have a house to give up for leading out fellowship. What you have will not even matter at all if you don't contribute it, if you don't give it in for the work. And therefore the temptation will be, why am I giving it to God? The graduates are there. The highly placed people are there. They can do it all. I mean, they have all the talents, all the money, all the things that are needed. They have it. So why do I bother myself? It will just be ridiculous. If all these people go forward now and they contribute all that they have, and I go in there and I drop two mites, I'll just be disturbing the people who really want to give. But you know, God isn't thinking like that. God is totally different. God actually appreciates that with your poverty, with your ignorance, with your... Um, lack of knowledge and lack of understanding and you don't know too much and you can't contribute too much and yet you are bringing in the two minds. And Christ is paying attention to that. Now, in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Verse 13 to verse 16. This wisdom have I seen also under the sun, and it seemed great unto me. There was a little city, and few men within it. And there was a great king. There came a great king against it, and besieged it, and built great bulwarks against it. Now, there was found in it a poor wise man, and he, by his wisdom, delivered the city. Yet no man remembered that same poor man. You see that? I'm, I'm telling you that you can do something very great, but because... You are a poor man, a poor woman, an ignorant man, a foolish woman. Because you don't have a great name, a great personality, you can deliver, you know, your little house fellowship, this little city, or this, uh, or a small church, or your little zone from a great difficulty that a great king, the devil, has brought against that house fellowship or that zone, or this church. And you, even though you are, you are weak, you are poor, you are foolish, you are ignorant, yet, because it's not by power of an army, it's not by might of a multitude, but by the Spirit of God in that poor man or that poor woman, that wisdom is given to you, and you deliver that little house fellowship, or that little zone. Or, or just a single family from the war that the great king, the devil, has brought against it. And do you know, according to that verse 15, yet no man remembered that same poor man. You may not be remembered. The house fellowship leader may not even write a report and say so and so did this. The Sunan leader may not recognize it. I mean, no man recognizing what that poor man, poor woman has done. But then it's written in the Bible, which means that God himself took note of it. And heaven has recorded it down. And in the great eternal day, when we stand before the judgment throne of God, that poor man, 
not recognized by people will be wonderfully rewarded. Then said I, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. But consecrate it to God. Give it to God. Uh, don't say, well, it doesn't matter. To God, it matters. Only two mites. God needs it. Just a little knowledge. God needs it. You know, sometimes we're here and um, we're having a house fellowship study. And a question is uh, asked. And of course, you know that uh, you are new in this whole thing. And uh, we ask people to raise up their hands. And a little type of uh, statement is coming uh, up in your heart. And uh, you say, well, why should I worry myself? You look uh, right and left. And, you know, these other great Christians are there. I mean, these zona leaders, the reservoir for knowledge. And, uh, you know, our area leaders are there. You know, these dynamic giant killers. And there you are. There's a little statement in your heart. You know, you could just raise up your hand and just give that sentence. But you won't. Because you don't know that those two mites will be important to God if you just rise up and say it. Or in the zone. The zona leader is having a meeting. And he said, well, he wants contribution of people, uh, you know, whatever you can say to help us solve this problem. Of course, you have an idea, but, I mean, it's just a foolish idea to you. And you are a foolish person, you, you don't know the whole of the Bible. Now, suppose I just rise up and say this now, and it uh, ends up at being just two mites of an idea. Who will recognize it? Well, Christ will recognize it. He will know that out of your penury, out of your ignorance, out of your foolishness, you have contributed that. It will not pass heaven's attention. What I mean is, it will not pass their notice. Heaven will notice it. It will not be neglected. I mean, people may laugh and smile and say, well, thank you, sister. We don't know whether it will be useful at all. But anyway, thank you. Don't worry about that. Heaven knows you have said all that you have. And that's enough. Now come to 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30. Let me read from verse 1. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Siglach on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Siglach and had smitten Siglach. And burnt it with fire, and are taking the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, neither great nor sm or small, but carried them away and went on their way. Now, verse 3 So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burnt with fire, and their wives, and their sons, and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. You see the trouble? You see the predicament? Verse um, 6. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man, for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord is God. But uh, the point I want you to notice is still further downwards. Verse 7 now. And David said unto Abiathar, the priest, Ahimelech's uh, son, I pray thee, bring me hither the effort. And Abiathar brought hither the effort to David. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered them, answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. A great victory was before David. Now, he had lost much, and this uh, big man, this old man, this king, he wept. And all his followers wept until 
Nobody could sympathize with the other person. They wept until there was no more strength to win. Then David managed to wipe off the tears and then asked the Lord, Are all these things lost forever? Will we never see this? Shall we never see these women anymore? Have we lost our wives forever to these enemies? The city is burnt. We have lost all our property. Or is it possible we still regain all that we have lost? And God said, you will regain everything. Pursue them. Victory is in front of you. And he pursued. Now look at verse 11. And he found an Egyptian in the field. And brought him to David. And gave him bread. And he did it. And they made him drink water. And they gave him a piece of cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him, for he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days and three nights. And David said unto him, To whom belongest thou? And whence art thou? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite, and my master left me because three days are gone, I fell sick. We made an invasion upon the south of Kerithites, and upon the coast which belongeth to Judah, and upon the south of Caleb, and we burned Siglag with fire. And David said unto him, Canst thou bring me down to this company? And he said, Swear unto me by God that thou wilt neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring thee, thee down to this company. And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they are taking out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. And David smote them from the twilight, even unto the evening of the next day. And there escaped not a man of them, save four hundred young men, which rode upon camels and fled. And David recovered all. Stop right there. How did he get the victory? There was a sick, dying, dejected, rejected servant that a warrior should not worry about. He should have just passed by that servant, that Egyptian. What was his concern about that Egyptian, already rejected by his own master, sick and dying, and are not eating for three days? After all, David had enough trouble. His wives had been taken away. The property had been taken away. He had wept until there was no more strength. So why pay attention to this a little Egyptian that was dying away? Let him take care of his own problem. But you know, you should never overlook little things. Small people, illiterate people, uneducated people, dying people, servants that have no monetary value, no educational value, no value according to human beings, because God uses them. Zona leader, you'll find them in your zone. Now, they themselves have their problems. Maybe they are even sick. Maybe they are dejected. Maybe they are rejected. Maybe they have no value. I mean, you can't put any value on them. Educationally, financially, uh, socially, no value at all. Because all they have, you can bring to two mites. And yet, that promise that God has given us of the victory resides in that poor man, that servant. Thank God, David did not say, Oh yes, I'm going for victory. I'm going for the battle. I'm going to recover everything. I don't have time for a servant Egyptian boy. He called him. Who are you? What are you doing here? From where are you? Why are you alone like this in the wilderness sake? And there is nobody to take care of you. And he began to tell stories. Of course, David had fed him. And he said, can you bring me there? Of course, I know where there. You don't have to beat about the bush. 
I'll just take you right there. And he took him there. That's how he got the victory. Never overlook small people. Ignorant people. Foolish people. Don't put a slave value on people. And say, well, he can do nothing. He can do much more than you think. Come to the New Testament. Acts chapter 23. I'm going to read fast, so uh, open quickly because the time is gone. Acts chapter 23. I want you to look at verse 11 first before I read something else to you. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. For thou, as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Now Paul had that um, prophetic statement. The plan of God laid out before him. He was going to be a great witness, a great testimony. Where? At Rome. The very siege of power of the Roman Empire. Empire. But now after he received that prophetic utterance, look at verse 12. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. That promise of God is not going to be fulfilled. God is, is not going to be able to do what he said he would do through Paul because these people, according to them, they bounded themselves together and they were going to kill Paul. Verse 13, and there were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, we have, we have bound ourselves under a great cause that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Now therefore, ye with the council signify to the chief captain that he bring him down unto you tomorrow, as though ye would inquire something more perfectly concerning him. And we, or ever he come near, are ready to kill him. We just, we come by him at the, the way I said, they are bringing him back to you, and we just kill him off. Verse 16. And when Paul's sister's son heard of their line in which he went and entered into the castle and told Paul. That's our man there. Young, not an evangelist. I'm sure you know that. Not a house fellowship leader. I'm sure you can see that. It's not a great dynamic preacher. It's not an apostle like Paul, you know, to go to Paul and tell him a vision. And tell him, you know, a great thing when he was praying and speaking in tongues and the interpretation came, what the Lord is saying through him. No, not, it's not as spiritual as that. Just an ordinary man like you, like me. I mean, just a young person, just a young fellow that heard the information. That 40 people, more than 40 people, had bounded themselves together. They were going to kill Paul. He didn't have a verse of scripture. He didn't have a word of encouragement. All he had was just, you know, this little information. If that can be of any help to an apostle in prison. You know, at this time, uh, the uh, apostle Peter could not come around to hell. You know, there wasn't a great um, evangelistic move to deliver Paul from the prison or from custody. And, you know, we didn't have uh, many experienced people coming together saying, Oh, this is our time to help out our Apostle Paul. You know, just this uh, young man, Paul's sister's son, he heard. Verse 17. Then Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, Bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he hath a certain thing to tell him. So he took him, and brought him to the chief captain, and said, Paul the prisoner called me unto him, and prayed me to bring this young man unto thee, who has something to, to say unto thee. Then the chief captain took him by the hand, 
and uh, went with him aside privately and asked him, What is that? What, what is that thou hast to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to desire thee that thou wouldest bring down Paul tomorrow into the council, as though they would inquire somewhat of him more perfectly. But do not thou yield unto them, for they, for there lie in wait for, for him of them more than forty men, which are bound themselves with an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now are they ready, looking for a promise from thee? So the chief captain then let the young man depart and charged him, See thou tell no man that thou hast showed these things to me. And he called unto him two centurions, saying, Make ready two hundred soldiers to go to Caesarea. And uh, all horsemen, three score and ten, and spearmen two hundred at the third hour of the night, and provide them beasts that they may set Paul on and bring him safe unto Felix the governor. Well, in short, he was on his way to Rome in fulfillment of what God said. Because of what that, you know, little boy, young man has come to say. It didn't come with a prophecy, with a verse of scripture, with a sermon. You think about it, that uh, you are locked up in a custody. I'm sure you'll be expecting the zonal leader to come. If he comes, that will be wonderful. But you know, he doesn't come. And uh, you know, just um, a secondary school uh, chap heard about it and uh, came to the police uh, station saying I've come to visit uh, my brother because uh, you know he's my brother I eat in his house he's, you know, he just loves every one of us and I heard that they said that he stole my brother can never steal I mean the simplicity the innocence of that child may make the policeman to say this man is an innocent man but, you know, you see that secondary school chap, uh, you know, coming to visit you in the custody, and you say, so this is all that came. Zona leader, not around. Uh, Brother Kumuyi is busy preaching to multitudes at Bagada. And uh, myself, Walker, I am here. They will not come. They are doing evangelism. Me, perishing here. They don't remember me. And this is the little boy that came. Immediately you see the little boy. You won't even allow the little boy to contribute his two miles. To be used of God. You'll just say, did you see Zona leader yesterday or today? <laughs> and he said, well, I did go to Zona. I just had and I came. Run back. Go and tell them. I'm suffering here. I'm telling you something. Allow that little boy. He may not have a verse, a prophecy, or a vision. The Spirit of God is sending him. You know, we reject uh, all these little, little things. We don't consecrate little things to God. You are very, very sick. And uh, a new convert who just com got converted last Easter, heard about it, and he came. And uh, he said, brother, I heard you are sick. Let me pray for you. How you will say you don't understand? You won't allow that boy to pray. I mean, can God answer his prayers? When you have been here, rolling on the bed for three, four days, and this is a new convert, Easter retreat convert, coming to pray. You won't allow him to pray. And yet, if he prays, you'll get out of that bed. Don't despise little things. And if you have a little thing, don't hold it back. Bring it out. Contribute it to the progress of the world. Consecrate these little things to God. Now, listen to me. Now, 1871, that is um, 114 years ago, something happened in Chicago that was related by R.A. Torrey. He was um, later the president of uh, the Bi Moody Bible Institute. Now, somebody had um, put on the light of a little candle a woman and this woman was milking the cow just in the farm and uh, the cow kicked the little um, the little candle 
and it got on the hay that the cows you, that the cows feed on and caught fire. Before they knew what was happening, that lead, little candle light had gone on the next house and the next house and the next house. That year, because of that little candle fire that started in a little way like that, do you know what happened? In houses of one mile uh, broad, three miles uh, length, that's three square miles, everything burnt down, remaining only two houses. Very destructive, that little thing. Just the cow kicking that off, getting on the hay, getting on the next house, getting on the next house, a rectangular plot of one mile by three miles got burnt up, except leaving only two houses. Now, negatively, you may do something that is very, very small. Just a little destructive fire. And you say, well, in any case... Uh, I have the liberty to do whatever I want to do. I know if uh, Brakumi does this, it's very delicate because he is leader. If uh, Zona leader does this, it's very bad because he is a leader. Well, I'm just an ordinary little candle here at the corner of my farm. And that little fire, you know, will get on there to the next house, to the next house, and can burn everything down. A little thing. But then... If it's the fire of the Holy Ghost, you are just a small person. If the fire burns in you, catches on your wife, catches on your mates, catches on your children, catches on the, on the children at home, on the children at school. The children at school get the fire, catches on their parents, the parents it catches in the office, it can lighten the whole of this city. Just starting from you, from a small, insignificant person. And you can make it constructive, make it very good, very little, or make it destructive, very bad, yet just a small thing starting. In any case, what you don't consecrate to the Lord, the devil will take and use. And little things are mighty in the hands of the devil too. Therefore, bring your little things together. And consecrate these little things, little things, to God. And as you do, I believe that you will see that there will be great harvesting of souls. There will be great reward in heaven. Rise up and let us pray. Now when you say you consecrate your life, that's a big thing. Look for the small, small things in your life tonight and consecrate them. You know, your little tongue... Consecrate it to God. Your little resources, consecrate to God. Your little wisdom, consecrate it to God. Your insignificant knowledge, consecrate it to God. I hear some people say, I don't have time, I don't have time. The little time you have, consecrate it to God. The little time you have, the little wisdom you have, the little money you have, bring the little things to God. Your little gifts, bring them to God. Don't be guilty of saying that God cannot use the little things you have. 